everybody, and welcome back to the workshop. In today's episode, we've got a real treat planned for you. We're going to be flying down and visiting with master bladesmith Steve Schwarzer, who's been making and writing about Damascus since before the internet was even invented. And who knows how long ago that was. But before we do any of that, let's thank today's sponsor, which is Squarespace. Now, I first found Squarespace about four years ago when I built my first ever website there, which was an absolute miracle because then, even more so than now, I was ridiculously tech illiterate. So if someone like me can build a website on there, that means that probably if you're able to watch this YouTube video, someone like you can probably do it as well. Now, Squarespace is a platform that is perfect for hobbyists, professionals, Jobbyist, that's what I call my job because really knife making should be a hobby, but somehow I do it full time and have a great time doing it and can still run it semi professionally because I have a swell website. Now, that website has the capabilities of having members only areas. You can run commerce, you can have galleries, portfolios, you can connect your social media accounts to it, and if you sell in person, you can have a point of sale system and inventory logging hooked up to it as well. They've got all sorts of other plugins, ways to process credit cards and PayPal, and all sorts of things that is not only easy to configure and configure well using some of their pre-uploaded and pre-designed website templates. Make sure to go check out squarespace.com forward slash willstelter for a free trial and 10% off your first purchase. With that, let's head on down to Florida and see what Steve has to say on the topic of Damascus steel. Who am I? I'm Steven Schwarzer. I've been forging blades and playing with iron for over 50 years. Well, there are two distinct forms of it. There's cast Damascus. Uh, modern pattern weld is layered different alloy steels to create a pattern. So that's commonly called Damascus, but it's not. This is this is the quote, true Damascus, <laughs> if there is such a thing, but there's two distinct types. So one's pattern welded and one is cast. What's the other name for that cast Damascus? That's the Wootz. Wootz typically was out of the northern India or Russia. When was Wootz developed? About 400 BCE. It is a carbide uh, structure that's developed by forging and that's developed out of the dendritic formation of actually casting the steel. The steel was heated and cast in crucibles, and any casting will form dendrites almost without exception. And then by precision forging, you can develop a pattern in that material. In my opinion, yeah. I mean, it's, it's the real deal. It's just two different techniques. Uh, some people say only crucible stuff is, and well, that's nonsense. I mean, they've been producing iron for over 4,000 years and uh, for specific reasons. Some of it was uh, made from uh, the things from the stars. This is a nickel iron meteorite. And, and as far as I know, the first iron blades were forged out of this skyfall material, particularly in Middle East and Indonesia, but a nickel iron meteorite. That goes back, way back. Uh, the, when they first started making iron, my hypothesis is there was different people making iron and they were doing the tamahagani. Oh, well, that's Japanese for bloomery iron, basically is what it is. But they also did it all over Europe. They used bog iron, which was actually a bacteria that sublimated a, what they call limonite, or a, uh, it was a bacterial excretion in a bog and they call it bog iron. And it's, it's caused by bacteria that nuclei the iron out into a concretion and they would extract a concretion and reduce that by heating and forging into a bloom. And so that was the very first, earliest stuff was bog iron. But you got to understand that mass was, it was a mess. It comes out and you can look up all kinds of YouTube and stuff on how it's done. But they forged that together and it was a matter of folding and forging to clean it. So that was the first patterning. It all made a pattern because it was different, a little bit different alloy that came out of the cooker, that sort of thing. And how I think the artistic end of it came is when they, this material was far superior after it was forged and clean, there would be a little bit left. 
and then the guy from the next forge over would go, well, I got a little of mine left, but his a little different alloy. And so he'd bring it over and they would combine those two. And uh, one of the guys would look at it and go, oh, that's a different color. That, that. And then there's some artistic kid in the crowd says, man, you got two different colors. If you fold it this way, it's going to make that. And I think that's how it all started. It was probably made when the first blacksmiths arrived on ships. And they weren't looking for pattern, they were looking for usable material. And so high carbon steel was at a premium, so they rarely ever used all high carbon. So they would take, quote, scrap iron, or they would take bog iron and make a body, and then they would add the hardened pieces. If you etch that, it would show a color difference in the alloys, which is pattern welding. And uh, then, of course, they developed more of it. What's funny is uh, the, quote, big resurgence in the U.S. was in the 70s. Daryl Meyer and uh, his crew up at Carbondale were doing serious research on the old European patterns and that sort of thing. But there were also, in a co cottage industry, there was horseshoers all over America, and, it, and I know of at least 40 around the Ocala area that were shoeing racehorses. And they were blacksmiths, farriers. They didn't care about a knife or pattern welding, but they would take a hard piece of steel and a bunch of buggy spring and a bunch of horseshoe nails and they would forge themselves a hammer or a pair of tongs. And if you etched them, they would be pattern welded. They just, they weren't doing it in conjunction with cutlery or knives. The first I was aware of pattern welding in the United States was in the, in the early to mid 70s. Uh, there was a bladesmith in Limekill, Maryland named Bill Moran, who did some simple pattern welded blades and presented them at the Guild Show and they were a big hit. But at the same time, there was a big research group working up the University of Illinois that was headed up by Daryl Meyer and Jim Wallace was there I think Bill Farini was involved in that, and there was another guy, I'm not sure who it was, but they were all doing very advanced pattern welding techniques. And that was my first knowledge of it. And that's what drove me to do that. And uh, that was, that's where my association with Al Pendre, who did the first Woots research, we teamed up on a bunch of stuff, uh, pattern welding and cast Damascus. The most common misconceptions about it, I think, is that it's some kind of super material. And it's not, it's more, it's more of an art. Uh, it's, it's more of a beauty thing than a performance thing. It, uh, except in very, very rare cases, as I stated before, there's about 1% of the bladesmiths that can make it shine above its base metals. And it's, a, it's, that requires a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience, a lot of forging experience. Anybody just about can weld it. Uh, used to be that was the hard part, getting it to stick together, but now it's, it's with the machinery and the techniques and, the, and all the TV, <laughs> you can go look it up and, and manage to get some of it stuck together. But to be really creative with it, uh, you, have to, you have to think it through. I've got my, my background is in antique uh, millefiori, Italian glass, Egyptian glass, and polymer clay. That's where a lot of my original ideas came from, and I followed those techniques and applied them to alloys of steel. Uh, with those mediums, with the glass mediums and the clay mediums, you don't have oxidation problems. And so the main thing with pattern welding is overcoming oxidation. If you can keep the air off of it, it'll weld. Almost any of it, you can get it to weld together. Some of the stainless and stuff, do, they weld easy, but they're very difficult to forge. So I take my hat off to the young guys that are doing some very serious manipulation with the stainlesses. The first recorded case of industrial espionage had to do with that. So what, what did you have to have in the Navy to get where you're going accurately? Well, the longitude you could get by the stars, but latitude you had to get with a good clock. You had to know how far. In order to have a good clock, you had to have good clock springs. So this English guy had developed this blister steel 
And basically what they did is they took a big iron block and they heated that block up red hot and packed carbonaceous material around it and soak carbon into the block and then they would take it out and they would quench it and form blisters and they'd knock those blisters off and that was called blister steel. And so you take that blister steel and lay it and weld it. And if there happened to be a little alloy difference in what they were using, you would get a physical pattern. You can see it. And he wasn't a bad man, but he was very secretive. And so they had the best springs. And so the British Navy could be anywhere they wanted to be exactly in the world, which was like holding the atomic bomb. Well, one night this guy's making blister steel, rainy, snowy, an old bum drunk falls up against his shop out there and the old man being kind, not a mean guy, didn't want the guy to die. So he drug him in next to the hearth and this guy laid there all night with one eye cracked open. And next thing you know, his secrets all over Europe. Well, that was the force re first recorded case of industrial espionage that I know of had to do with ironwork and knives and springs. <laughs> Tamahagani, it was junk, and you had to make it into something wonderful. Everybody says, oh, it's the best, they made the best swords. Yes, they did, but what people don't realize is the Japanese were at a disadvantage when they used it because every pile of that Tamahagani or the guys that are doing bloomery steel, every bit of it is different than the last batch. None of it is the same. So what they have to do is get it out, work it, and refine it, and get it into a bar, and then they have to figure out how to heat treat it. So they have to do that with every blade. And uh, uh, so me and a few friends of mine got our heads together, and we're trying to figure out how they managed to get these beautiful heat treats and hormones and all these stuff on these big blades without destroying them, because you would have to test it three or four times in order to do it. And... Uh, and we're looking at that and going, I went, oh my goodness. They took a little piece of that steel and they tested that little blade until they got it right before they did it to the big one. And it makes so much sense. I don't think anybody can debunk that because if those blades, a lot of those little blades will have hormones and stuff in them because they were tested with the main blade. It's the only thing that makes any sense at all. Yes, you can save yourself a lot of misery by taking a course from somebody that knows what they're doing. Uh, there are a lot of experts out there, and some of them actually are. <laughs> you need to find you a guy that's been at it a long time and has good success. Uh, there's a whole group of, of young smiths now that are just rocket ships in this, in this art form. And you can find one of them, and a lot of them offer classes. There's good guys out on the West Coast, East Coast, Florida, wherever. You can take a good class, and it'll save you years of struggling. And, and don't not do it because it's hard. You do the stuff that's hard because it makes you grow. And uh, don't be afraid to teach, but teach the people that have an open mind. You can't, you can't pour knowledge in a broken bucket. It won't stay. Amen. Well, thank you guys so much for watching today's video. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Steve is an absolute wealth of knowledge and knows way too much about Damascus. He didn't say it, but I'm pretty sure he was there when they first made it in 400 BC. Stay tuned for more content involving Steve because if we're being honest, He's a national treasure, incredibly smart guy, and he's really done it all. So I'm thrilled that he is so involved still in the bladesmithing community and on social media. Make sure to go check out his Instagram account, Steve Schwarzer. Another huge thanks to today's sponsor, which is Squarespace. And if you haven't picked up a pallet jack gang shirt, make sure to go check that one out. Thank you, patrons, and I will see you on the next one. Goodbye.